thank you. Thank you for your minimal applause. Um, it's no, it's, no, no, please don't. But thanks for this also. But uh, my name is Constant Dulat. Uh, in English, a lot of people think it's, uh, it means all the time boring art. Uh, constant dull art. Well, uh, now we see how many native uh, speakers there are. So um, uh, I have to apologize that I uh, can't speak um, any local languages uh, or single language. Um, so I started with this video because this is my relationship to you, basically. I barely know anybody, so I'm trying to adjust and trying to make you like me. Um, these are just the pictures I found online in 2007 of group pictures, and I put myself in it. But um, this is just a start. Welcome to Google. Thanks for using our products and services. Services. The services are provided by Google Inc. Google. Located at 1600 Amphitheater Parkway, Mountain View, California, 94043, United States. By using our services, you are agreeing to these terms. Please read them carefully. Our services are very diverse, so sometimes additional terms or product requirements, including age requirements, may apply. Anyway, the funny thing is with Google that you agree to the, all of this as soon as you use the website, so you don't have to actually do anything. As soon as you go there, you agree with all of this. All of this text already. This is gonna. This go on for go on. This does go on for like 20 minutes or 30 minutes. So I'm not gonna have the entire talk be like this. But um, this is just one of my works where uh, Google reads the contract to you. And uh, I wanted to actually show you this image. And this image is. Um, a uh, recent image that I restored called Jennifer in Paradise. And it's actually the very first image that was ever uh, photoshopped, or the very first picture that was ever photoshopped. And it was shown in several documentaries, but I couldn't find it anywhere online. And how special is it now in these times to find an image that is not online? Almost every fact is documented. As soon as there's a kind of cultural or historical relevance to something, then you will probably find this image online. Um, but not with this image. Jennifer in Paradise, that first image that was ever photoshopped was lost, or it wasn't there, or it was still in the ownership of the people that actually created the program, Photoshop. But then I found it through different traces and how they showed it and how people talked about it, so I restored it. And um, this image was taken in, about in around 1988, and it's... Um, Actually, at that time, it was the girlfriend of John Knoll, and John and Thomas Knoll together, they programmed Photoshop. And uh, I thought it was interesting of, of a program that has such a cultural impact that now, if we look at any image in the news, if we look at anything uh, represented well, you see it here, like there's so many image alterations that it's actually, you get used to this kind of um, alternate reality, but like how it started with this program was with this image. So I decided to write a letter to Jennifer, to, because now actually John and Jennifer are married. They have four children, but I'll reveal that in the, in the letter that I wrote to her. I, I wrote to her and I uh, published it openly because I couldn't reach her. I was twittering and emailing to her and, and doing all this, but she didn't respond, so I decided to write an open letter to her. So I'll read it now. Dear Jennifer, sometime in 1988 you were sitting on a beach in Bora Bora, looking at Te'opoa Island, enjoying a holiday with a very serious boyfriend. The serious boyfriend, John, took a photograph of you sitting on the beach, not wearing your bikini top. John later became your husband and father to your children, Sarah, Lisa, Alex, and Jane. This photograph of a beautiful moment in your personal history has also become a part of my history and that of many other people. It has even shaped our outlooks on the world at large. John's image of you became the first photograph to be publicly altered by the most influential image manipulation program ever. Of course, this is why I know the names of your children, and this is also why I know about the cool things you're trying to do with the dot .green top-level domain name. Probably, as you know, that uh, top-level domain names like .com or .me or dot all these kind of things are changing. And, um, and Jennifer is actually in the board of trying to get a dot .green domain name for environmental sustainability. Um, although I personally believe uh, that the importance of the domain name is fading because everybody's using Facebook and everybody's using Google anyway, so nobody types in a domain name anymore. Um, I still wonder if you felt the world change there on that beach. 
The fact that reality would be more moldable, that normal people could change their history, brighten up their past, and put twirl effects on their faces. That holiday image was dis distributed with the first demo editions of Photoshop and your intimate beach moment became the reality for many people to play with. Two Jennifers, no Jennifer, less clouds, etc. In essence, it was the very first Photoshop meme. But now the image is nowhere to be found online. Did John actually ask you if he could use that image of you? Did you enjoy seeing yourself on the screen as much as he did? Did you think you would be the muse that would inspire so much contemporary image making? Did you ever print out the image? Would you be willing to share it with me and so the other people for whom it took on such an unexpected significance? Shouldn't a museum have the negatives of that image, not to mention the digital backups of its endless variations? All these questions have made me decide to redistribute the image, Jennifer in Paradise, as well as I can, somewhat as an artist, somewhat as a digital archaeologist, restoring what few traces of it I could find. It was, so st I, it was sad to realize this blurry screen grab was the closest I could get to the image, but beautiful at the same time. How often do you find an important image that is not online in several different sizes already? This beautiful artifact of software development has become an, art, has become an artwork in this way, in which you, or at least your depiction, play a central part in this body of work that has become so dear to me. A faint, blurry, pixelated focal point. A work that celebrates the time that you were young and the world was young and it still naively believed in the authenticity of the photograph. Sometimes when I'm anxious about the future of our surveilled computer-mediated world, when I worry about cultural imperialism and about the politics behind software design, I imagine myself traveling back in time, just like the Terminator to that important moment in technological world history, there on that beach in Bora Bora, and just sit there with you, watching the tide roll away. Sincerely, Constant Dulat. So this is a letter I, I published to her, and in, uh, by now I'm actually in contact with her husband. She hasn't responded yet, <laughs> um, which I'm still kind of sad about. So I keep um, uh, reiterating this letter and in the hope that maybe there's a video that will come out and that she will actually respond. If she, if you, if she Googles herself, um, which is a daily practice for me when that I Google myself. But then anyway, then she would find the very first link is this letter. So I hope, um, I hope she reads it and actually responds because I want to really go to that beach and sit there with her. Uh, but anyway, I think this is funny that there's, uh, there's a cultural impact to this image. I mean, also the fact that he offered uh, a depiction of his wife, his beloved, to his customers to manipulate. So he would say like, okay, you can cut her out and you can make two of her. So he's basically offering her as a, uh, to objectify her, to make her into an object. And this is of course very normal within that the female body turns into an object within photography and especially within art photography. But then when it's the base of this program, manipulation program, and now you see of course that there's so many alterations and you would see fashion magazines where there's the alterations of the female body, then you would have, then it's just kind of significant that within the core, the very first image that was shown to be photoshopped, they already show a half-naked woman and how you can double her and how you can have more of this half-naked woman. Anyway, I think this is uh, quite remarkable, but they're happily married or I don't know if they're happily married, they're still married. Um, <laughs> Anyway, but the, for me, the important thing about this, mess this, this image, and now comes the second thing, is that I actually hid a, a message inside the photograph. So all this, this photograph is spread now online on different blogs because people are talking about this very first Photoshop image. But the way that Anonymous or a lot of hacker groups or a lot of just security experts in general are talking online, and if you want to talk securely, you can actually encrypt a message inside an image. So you send somebody a, an image or you put it online of funny cats, for example, because that's what everybody does. And then you put a message inside and only the person on the other side that has the password can take out the message. So you just download several images of cats or whatever. So what I did, and you saw it just now, that, there's UV, that there was UV paint and the UV paint reveals the same message as if it was online. So actually if if somebody would want to buy this work, or if, so, if it goes somewhere, then you would also have the password to that hidden text inside the JPEG file. So inside the JPEG code, there's a hit, this hidden text, but nobody can reach it unless you have the password. So that's why I needed, after the performance, to destroy the UV light, 
because otherwise people would just be able to switch on the UV light and read the message and I don't want that because this whole work is an illustration of we don't have access to the entire internet. The internet is in layers. The internet is only certain parts of it are accessible to everybody. You have to have knowledge or money or access until you have like all these different layers. And I think this is going to be the communication of the next few decades, how we distribute, uh, distribute this kind of access to information and how we deal with the fact that we can publish information everywhere where we want. So these are images of uh, the performance I did. And this is uh, an image that I didn't take, but Thomas did took, so the brother, the other brother, Thomas Knoll, so the brother of John Knoll. This is uh, Dolomites, and, uh, and this is an eagle. So the guy that invented Photoshop filters, that invented all these kind of attributes of how to manipulate images, how to be creative with photography, now makes these kind of images, very generic kind of images, and puts them on his Facebook. And the nice thing about Facebook is that I hate it, and, uh, but actually it has a download button for the images. So of course I downloaded these images. I thought, who's better images I can collect than the guy that actually wrote Photoshop filters. He made this funny twirl filter. He made all these kind of... So what I did is actually, I, when I show them, I put them behind this kind of pattern glass that you would normally see in bathroom windows, which is in essence the same as a Photoshop filter. It's just a layer that you present the picture behind. But you get this kind of manipulation. But the, fun the funny thing for me is also like, is it still his image? His image is printed out there. And if you would manipulate it in Photoshop, you could, for example, say that the copyright to the image is changed. But did it change if you only present it behind a different kind of glass? Does it then also change? Like what manipulation is more real? His filter that he programmed or the glass in, in how you interpret the image? So how you, from which angle you uh, uh, view the image? So this is that kind of the raindrop effect over the eagle. And now I go a bit step back into this kind of, um, um, into this kind of uh, uh, development in my work that, I s that when Google Images started to be more popular, I got interested in the way that it's influencing representation and how we access representation. So, of course, I looked how Google Images itself was represented on Google Images. And I think if you use Google Images recently, you see that it doesn't look like this at all anymore. It doesn't have the blue lines, and it just looks completely different. But um, we, like, with a couple of artists, and this is, I think, the, was at least for me the wonderful thing to present, uh, or to, to actually to show my work within this kind of, within the format of the internet, or, and that I could find a lot of friends that were doing similar research. So this is a friend of mine, Martijn Hendricks, that put a, image search for white square file type JPEG so you would only get the white images. And I think that's nice that the internet apparently needs white images. It needs nothing. So it, and he was basically looking for the nothing, the image qualification of nothing on the web. And you would find this and of course I could emphasize this the way that Google Images looked at that time. Um, and what I decided to do is that to speed up this process, to look for, so these are all kind of different websites there are different pages reloading after each other, but with the, with the color, the color um, sorting function of Google images switched on. So these are red, blue and yellow images of diseases. So and then reloading the page after each other, you actually get a disco effect. So then I included like shitty disco music from the time I made it. I actually hate the Black Eyed Peas, but um, this is the music that was popular at that time. So then you get this kind of effect. So I would really enjoy it kind of misappropriating these kind of new tools that were, were given to us. Um, and then I actually found out that I could uh, animate the entire internet. I could just put the entire Google page inside a frame and animate it with code of a website. So actually everything I would go to afterwards, every website I would go to afterwards was actually animated. So I could make the entire internet say no and I have this animation. Of course, Google always presented itself as if it's um, objective and if it's just presenting information. But then other artists started to respond and another artist said, the internet said yes. So these kind of artificial opinions, and now of course we know 
that Google actually you know, has an opinion, how they're, filtering, how they're filtering information. We know all of that, but in the beginning it wasn't so apparent. We thought they were just, they were just like, giving through the information, not sorting it, but of course they were. Um, so and this continued, and then this became like a nice conversation. And that's, for me, always been the wonderful thing, that I could have this communication with people and people responding. So then I responded again with the doubting internet and uh, the sleeping internet. So this is the sleeping internet. This is the, the, the effect that Google uses to make you believe that the computer is asleep. You know, they programmed and they patented a rhythm of uh, the light going on and off 12 times per minute, and which is a standard human breathing rhythm. And uh, they patented the 12 times per minute, and then another computer, like uh, Dell, actually, tried to imply the same uh, light switching on and off, but they couldn't use that rhythm, so they used 40 times per minute. But that actually, if you switch it to breathing, <laughs> it's like you're out of breath, so you don't feel the computer is relaxing at all. Anyway, so this, these are uh, kind of mixings between, well actually, I can switch back, um, between how we perceive the computer and how welcome the computer is in our life. And if the computer acts like a human, I think we understand and we like it more and we want to get it in our house. That's one of the, one of the things that the, the Apple computer always wanted to be more human. The first Apple computers also have, a, a, not the clean white, but have this kind of yellowish, more skin tone, so it would be perceived as more human. Anyway, I found out that I could actually rotate the entire internet, and I was breaking up with my girlfriend at that time, and I was in a very romantic mood, I think, and, uh, and then I put music behind it, and normally I hate putting music behind my work, uh, but then I did it again as, as the, the other work before, and, um, and the funny thing was I programmed this, and I thought it, it was very beautiful, and I. I went to sleep because I coded the whole night. I was very proud. I'm, I have to say, I can't code very well. I just copy paste things until it works. And, uh, but the nice thing was that actually this became one of my most popular works. And until now, there's about four million people that have visited this. And also, I made it as an artwork. But the cool thing was that actually as an uh, artwork, it's worth a lot less than actually the domain name is worth because there's so many people that go to the domain name, if I would just put advertisement on it, I would have made a lot of money already. But because it's an artwork, I can't. Anyway, I can't, I won't. Um, and this is continuing, and then I'm wondering like, where a lot of these kind of uh, online things, of course there's the issue, like how do you show it? How do you document it? How do you save it for the future? There's 40 million people that saw it, but actually Google stopped supporting this code, and then suddenly my work was gone. And I thank God I have enough hacker friends that we could reverse engineer Google's search engine. But how do you save it? What do you do with it? So I was working on different methods and uh, with Sokovsky, a good friend of mine in Berlin. And we thought of this way that we actually have to document it. It's like a performance. If you make a website, it's just like a performance. It's actually the performance, but it's finished by a computer inside the network. So the server is finishing my performance. My intervention with reality is being finished by another computer. So if you look at it like performance, you're not going to freeze Marina Abramovic at the age of 32 and then defreeze her as soon as she's, uh, you know, as, and, and then defreeze all her social relevant contacts and her friends and the news and the, all the cultural situation of that time. You can't do that. So what you do is that you have documentation, be it shitty or not, but maybe we should think about documenting all of this stuff, like how culture is changing on the internet, just document it. So this was the method that I devised with, together with Sokovsky that you would record uh, the person using the internet and using the artwork and actually filming the artwork itself and then you would show it next to each other. Um, this is my, this was, with this work I closed my uh, Google series or the internet series and this is um, uh, a piece called uh, Untitled Internet and I basically just painted over, over the internet and then every time you reload, you go to in Untitled Internet, you see a new kind of painting so the, 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 the internet itself becomes like paint. Um, actually quite a slow typer I see. So you can go to any kind of content, any kind of news content. So I really see this as a live performative collage. Like you would see any kind of collage in the museum. If you would see 
well, let's say like uh, 60s, 70s collages with newspapers, I'm thinking about how would you do that now? Maybe you could do that live with a live intervention now that you would just, because newspapers aren't only printed anymore. Most people are reading it like this in the dynamic state. And then of course you again have this situation of how do you bring it to the gallery? So I take separate screenshots and I print them on glass and I know it's very boring to make <coughs> kind of printouts of something, but I still like the effect that the, that the white becomes transparent. Um, so these are images from the recent uh, NSA leaks. This is the, the cows in, in Lascaux. And this is a recent work um, which is called The Death of the URL. And I was referring to this earlier. Um, i just pause it for a minute because I wanted to have some more time to explain it. Um, so the URL is changing. Of course, like if you go to Facebook or I don't know, any, like if any of you, if you go online, if you actually go to that top bar and if you actually type in the domain name where you have to go. I don't anymore. I actually just go to Google and I search what I need and then I click the link. And I think most people would do that. Like most, you don't use this kind of infrastructure that was made for the web anymore. So this kind of URLs are not that, uh, these domain names are not that valuable anymore because it's not that important. It's mostly like, almost like a poetic, nostalgic attribute to the internet. It's like a beautiful title, you know, in front of, but everybody can find your house while they're looking on, on, on a map, but you don't really have to have the street name anymore. Um, so what I did is that there's actually, uh, there was this idea of having an XXX domain. So a dot XXX, triple X, of course, for adult content. And, uh, and what they tried to do, or what the idea behind it was, that all the adult content would all go together, nice and friendly, and would hang out only behind the .xxx domain, which is a kind of ridiculous idea that everybody would just self-censor them, themselves. And, uh, and also the idea, of course, of like what is, what is sexuality, how is uh, sexuality portrayed, is all different all over the world. But for example, in Britain, and I don't know how it is here, but in Britain, uh, what they try to do is actually have an adult, adult content filter already, that they try to filter the entire internet so that if you would access it, just like in China, actually, if you would access it, you wouldn't have to run into these kind of evil naked people. Um, so what I did is I bought this XXX domain name, but I had it forward to each other. So these are all kind of different XXX domain names and URLs, and they're forwarding to each other. So actually the nice thing is that the top URL bar becomes, like this would be a normal URL, almost like unreadable, and this is how I find it, like if I would go somewhere. Um, and then the top becomes the animation, and this becomes the title, instead of normally it's the other way around, that actually that's the title, and inside the image is the animation. Um, and the cool thing is, because I'm brute forcing this kind of refresh, that if you visit this website, and you look at your history, there's a bombardment of entries into your history. So I'm basically colonizing your history, just as every access to history is being colonized. So I would welcome you to go to this website, but just remember that it's gonna be very hard to find any links that you visited that day, because <laughs> most of them will look like this. Um, but this, of course, is an issue that there's, it's a very formal work, and this formal work exists online. And it's nice, and then you have artists respond to this, and I had very complimentous, com like very great responses from artists like Ali Ali Alina, and like I'm very proud that there's, that um, I got to mention some, such a formal piece. But how do I show it in a gallery with, for example, these other pieces that I made? And how do you in get into a conversation where these pieces actually come into a physical space and you do something with it? So now I just chose for a very simple floating projection where it's basically just mysteriously, but of course, because the internet has a front and a back, so you have like a, a thing that you see and you have the source where it comes from. That's why I showed the, the different sides of it. Anyway, but uh, this is also an early work I made, um, which is uh, animating the YouTube button. So you see that I'm interested in these kind of formal issues, like how do we access information? How do people design or the way that we access information? I mean, if you look at a newspaper, and now, for example, I was, um, this sounds stupid, but I just had like, a, recently there was somebody reviewing an exhibition, and it was in the tabloid size newspaper, so the smaller size newspaper, not the 
size newspaper that you have. To, and I always like this, the really big newspapers, because you can see grown men and old people just fundling around with these papers and they still didn't figure out how to handle these big newspapers, like the news is too big for them. And these small little tabloid newspapers are just like user friendly and just too nice and I don't actually take the news as serious anymore. Such a minimal, to me at least, such a minimal intervention in the design can already, um, can already influence how serious I take the news. So let alone like if I can see any kind of content, the news or artworks or whatever, and it's behind a button like this, you know, what is the influence of this kind of button? So that's why I thought this button should be uh, part of a, an artistic research. And that's what I did. And again, there were these kind of uh, uh, responses. So this was one of the most, the nicest compliments I got for as a response because uh, Ben Coonley in uh, Brooklyn actually decided to use this graphic element to respond to my YouTube button. So you see here that it's slightly, slowly disappearing. So this it spins too fast in this one. And there it falls down. So all these kind of very minimal interventions. Of course it's like just very, it's almost like slapstick, but like graphic design slapstick. But still, I think this kind of, these kind of minimal interventions or formal even interventions, I think were nice to do in this kind of existence or in this kind of how YouTube became popular. Actually, if I'm thinking about YouTube, YouTube is about eight, nine years old. So it's, I don't know if there's eight or nine years old in the, in the audience, but I don't trust them with all of my content. Uh, but we do trust YouTube with all of your content. Um, so anyway, and this is a billion dollar investment by, uh, you know, like actually, pretty um, um, extraordinary people uh, believing in money making as the important, the most important goal in life. Um, anyway, but then it was nice that these kind of works got into a discussion that more and more artists were responding to this and it started to be picked up and people responded to this and I think this for me was a very fertile place to, to present my work in. Um, <coughs> and then again, I was asked to, I mean, I'm trying to emphasize this, that the difficulty between translating something and bringing it to an exhibition, uh, I was asked, how do you put this work in an exhibition? I actually thought I was a bit annoyed because I thought it's on the internet already. It's the best exhibition there is uh, and people are writing about it. But then I thought, okay, so I'll just do it. And I copied these balls, but then made them into big styrofoam balls and had lights um, project on them one by one. And then you get this kind, of, this kind of animation. And the nice thing was that just as actually what will probably happen with the glasses, that people came into the space, they filmed like, oh, that looks like YouTube. And then they filmed it and put it back onto YouTube. <laughs> so then actually, thank God, my work was still relevant on the internet and not only in the gallery, because of course, you know, there's multiple spaces to think about now. And then uh, this just uh, became a part of my life, you know, these YouTube things. So I would wake up at eight o'clock in the morning and I would start to do these kind of meditative <laughs> sessions and just kind of trying to think about, you know, like all these people that are uploading content every fucking day. They're uploading content, they're trying to get subscribers, they're trying to make money with advertisement. They're trying to, they're this human factory that is giving us all this content, not anymore the TV stations, but this human factory of all these people with their small uh, phone cameras. Um, and then, of course, I, could, I got a bit fatter, and then uh, I decided to do it a bit noisier. <laughs> so for me, this is just showing the kind of friction behind the internet, right? There's, I mean, there's people designing this shit. There's people thinking like, oh, this will, 
You know, the fact that when we would have a VCR and when you would have the TV, you didn't have to wait for your request to be fulfilled. You didn't ask for something and then I had to sit there and wait until something would come. You know, you would just do it and press play and it would work. You maybe have to rewind something, but it's not getting searched from this larger archive. So we had to design, there's like these, these, these interventions that now we accept like, oh, if this comes up, we have to wait. And then actually when I'm doing this live, people are really saying like, oh, we have to wait. You know, until I, but of course I do it for 20 minutes and then I'm, <laughs> I'm fed up with it and I just quit. Anyway. Um, but then it comes back in the gallery again. So this was in Berlin, you have these kind of galleries, of course, like you have them everywhere with this kind of, well, in German you call it Stück, mm. this kind of decoration on the ceilings. And then I thought, I just buy the crappy kind of four euro uh, other continuation of the plastic Stück and I make this stuff again. So people were, and it's nice that this graphic intervention becomes a part of our life so much. And then of course I put the, this was in future galleries, so of course I put the YouTube button there. So it's these kind of really simple interventions. This is me uh, imitating the DVD uh, sign. So this is for everybody that feels for everybody that feels a bit nostalgic. This, I don't have that underwear anymore, by the way. Just I, I grown out of it, but I do like it anyway. But there's a and it was complicated because I was at a friend's house and she had this kind of stupid lights that I had to anyway. But I would do this as performances. So I would have a, a I would have an exhibition somewhere and they would Skype with me and then I would do this live on Skype. So I would also become this kind of design again, but human. So I became the human screensaver. So I just, did you take the picture already? Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> uh, there's another one. Because um, <laughs> I did so many of them. It's nice also, like I think that the work became nicer if I just, if I looked shittier. <laughs> Anyway, it's also very complicated to do. Sometimes I, I lose the way I need to go. Like I, just, I had to do it in mirror image. That's why I look so concentrated, not because I was high. <laughs> uh, and I would like to uh, end with, uh, let's see if I can switch this off. Yeah. Um, with, end with a, a final uh, image. I skipped that because that's actually a promo campaign for my new technological brand called uh, Daltech because my name is Dal Delart, but people think it's Dal Art, and then I thought like, well, it's just uh, people think it's also always a fake name, but I can show that my family lived in the town where I grew up in in 1090, so the name is truly real. But um, uh, I made a I'm, I'm starting a technology brand so I can actually put these screensavers that I was showing you inside the media players. So I can actually, because of course like I wanted to be inside the real media players. And uh, because there's a, a, a big problem with artists needing to sync, you know, double, like two projections needing to run at the same time, there's always a problem. So I went to China and talked to some tech people and we solved that problem. So soon there's gonna be a brand called Daltech, which we can have these players. And then if you don't have any USB sticks in it, um, then you're gonna see my work. So that's the, that was this, this logo actually that, um, Anyway, um, and this is the commercial, but you're going to be bombarded with it if you're interested. Um, this is a, a final Photoshop intervention, just a kind of poetic one, uh, where I'm using the, let's see if this is the long one. No, let me go back. Where I use the Photoshop waves, so actually the wave function to uh, give, um, um, yeah, to give artificial waves back to the sea. So basically saying like, and how much do we still believe in reality that if these artificial waves become actually more beautiful than the real waves that you're watching. Uh, this is also actually one of the rare websites that are actually did sell for more than it was worth in advertising, uh, but as an art piece. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. I also wanted to take one moment for, to thank actually the possibility uh, of Axioma to present in this, uh, uh, great um, context of a wonderful exhibition by Igor Strahlmeier and I'm very uh, proud that I was, I was able to talk about my uh, short practice within this uh, generous uh, environment. So thank you very much for your attention.